Okay, so that's the first thing. So consciousness and the world are inextricably, inextricably bound. You get rid of the world, you get rid of consciousness. You get rid of consciousness, you get rid of the world. You need both. Okay. The next is, the next bullet point under authentic reflection is the world of consciousness is a human, is a world of human subjects, right? The world of consciousness, right? Our conscious ability, and we recognize there's two forms of consciousness at, at this level inferior. The first being accessible consciousness, the th stuff around us, sort of the tapestry of life. And our internal consciousness, the, the content of our imagination. And he talks about the relationship between accessible consciousness and internal, internal consciousness, which I've described in previous videos. Right? So the world of consciousness is a world of human subjects. Right? Again, no way to talk about consciousness devoid of human subjectivity. Right? This state of affairs, where all that exists is a world where no humans live, is a world devoid of consciousness, right? Um, and some would even argue at this point, and I don't remember if Freer argues this at all, I would at least argue that there is no world, right? At the point where human beings cease to exist, the world ceases to exist, right? I'm sure a lot of physicists would disagree with that description, but I'm an epistemologist and I don't know how we would know that that world exists. So, devoid of human beings, but that's neither here nor there. Okay. Um, there's a paragraph that I actually want to read, the third bullet point, um, talks of the role of I and the not I in the world of consciousness. But to make sense of it, I want to actually read uh, a section out of the book. Okay, so on page, uh, on page 82 in the um, 30th anniversary edition, um, there's the following claim that this peasant makes, right? Uh, the peasant wished to express the idea that there would be lacking the consciousness of the world, which the consciousness of the world, my consciousness of the world, which necessarily implies the world of consciousness, right? I cannot exist without a non-I. I, Jason Campbell, cannot exist without, without my non-existence, the conceptualization of me not existing. My existence, in a, in a sense, is contingent on a recognition that um, I, Jason Campbell, exists, and therefore I, Jason Campbell, do not not exist, right? Double negation makes enough formation. So two negatives make a positive. My existence is my existence, Jason. As and actually, just to make this simple, J for Jason, right, is the same as saying not not Jason. The non-existence, um, my non-existence, not existing, right? The non-existence of my existence, right? So. It's exactly the same thing. Two negations is an affirmation. What he says is, the peasant wished to express the idea that there would be lacking the consciousness of the world, which necessarily implies the world of consciousness. I cannot exist without a non-I. In turn, the not-I depends on that existence, right? My, my negation, my negation, means that in order for it to be negated, right, in order for it to be negated, in order for, if I'm talking about Jason, then in order for it to be negated, there must be the thing that is being denied, right? There must be the I, right? In order for me to talk about my non-existence, if I'm talking about my existence, Jason, in order for me to talk about my non-existence, then there must be that which is being denied, right? Um, I don't want to attribute this to like a Cartesian um, sort of semantic move, but in a sense it is sort of Cartesian. And I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory sense because, I mean, Cartesian, Cartesian semantics have its own problem. But it's sort of like the evil genie argument, if you're familiar with it. The way that I know that I exist is that even if I'm being denied, there must be the I that is being denied. It's sort of the same type of argument. So I'll read it again, right? The peasant wished to express the idea that there would be lacking the consciousness of the world, which necessarily implies the world of consciousness. I cannot exist without a non-I. In turn, the not I depends on that existence. The not I depends on my existence. My non-existence is contingent on my existence. The world which brings consciousness into existence becomes the world of that consciousness, right? So the world which brings consciousness into existence, right? So we have to think of, in a sense, right? My, Jason, my relationship with the world is not that I stand outside of the world, Right? I don't stand outside of the world as independent to the world, but 
I stand within the world, right? So that I'm born into sort of a nexus that's already there, a pre-existing structure in which my consciousness is now, uh, has now appeared in a very real sense, right? And if you think about this in a, in a very, very simple sense, uh, whatever language you speak, I'm assuming you speak English, right? The existence of English was there existing in the world prior to my birth. Obviously, I couldn't know of the existence of English as an existent fact until I was born into the world. But the world is a nexus of all of these sort of pre-existing things, right? Pre-existing, and it's not even really things, all of these pre-existing possible consciousnesses, right? All the, the, the possibility for me to become aware of so many different things already exist independent to my, to my birth, right? Um, with respect to this idea of authentic reflection then, what I recognize is this nexus, right? I recognize, I recognize that I am caught up within a nexus. A nexus, and specifically a nexus of understanding. He doesn't use this phrase, but I do. Nexus of, right? This is not for years phrase, but I find myself in a nexus of understanding. There, there is a way in which I come to recognize my consciousness, my ability to think, in terms of my interrelationship with all these myriad forces of consciousness, right? Um, and I'll, I'll make more sense of that uh, in a second.